good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me present you uh, uh, shortly my view on possibility, but also existing limits on uh, security and defense cooperation uh, in Central Europe. I have chosen the name of my presentation as with question marks, security and defense cooperation mission impossible. Um, I've chosen deliberately this name uh, stemming from my personal experience. I was three years directly responsible for coordinating of the Visegrad cooperation and I spent 10 years at Central European Affairs uh, at Czech Ministry of Foreign Affairs. In the meantime, I was posted four years in Hungary. I have very good memories, by the way, on, on my stay in Hungary, in, in Budapest, and four, four years in Poland. And um, so that time I had an opportunity to observe uh, development Central European uh, cooperation in security and, and defense. And since then, I'm following uh, the development. And I can say that despite many declarations of ministers, ministers of defense, ministers of foreign affairs, prime ministers, and the presidents, we still lack a really major tangible results, major uh, project in, in security and defense cooperation among the Visegrad states. But saying this, I think we need to start uh, with short elaboration on how the group, the Visegrad group actually works. Uh, because I think that will necessary wise influence our assessment of the results. Uh, you know that the Visegrad group does not have any institution apart from International Visegrad Fund. And not only that it does not have any institution, it does not have also any rules how the agenda, uh, Visegrad agenda uh, is handled. Uh, it is, in the reality, quite informal grouping. Uh, it has just two basic documents defining the, the, the content of a cooperation. One is from uh, 1999, from Bratislava, uh, with the name uh, Content of the Visegrad Cooperation. Uh, the second one is from Summit of Est in Estergom 2002, which defines the role of the presidency. It is, it is actually annex to the first uh, document. But apart from them, uh, apart from that, there, there are no uh, strict rules. And as I said, it is rather informal grouping. You can uh, get into uh, Visegrad Group webpage uh, uh, to inquire more. But uh, I can, what, what we can say that uh, this informal character of the group is that uh, is something uh, very different from other regional grouping in, in Europe. I mean, uh, Nordic cooperation that has Nordic Council, Nordic Council of Ministers, its secretariat, or frequently mentioned uh, uh, Benelux. Benelux has also Council of Ministers, General Secretariat, even Court of the Benelux. So I say this at the beginning, uh, just to be aware that we taking into account this informal character of the group, we cannot have higher expectations in terms of results uh, uh, that uh, our expectations need to correspond to this uh, character of the, uh, of the group. Uh, security and defense cooperation is one of the field when where uh, certain limits throughout the entire existence of the Visegrad group uh, prohibit to achieve a really tangible results, as I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, despite the 
as I said, uh, frequently declared political will, you still face the situation that Visegrad's countries differ in their threat assessment. Not only that we have different threat assessment in terms of Russia, uh, we differ also in our threat assessment uh, in terms of Balkan, for instance, the Middle East. Um, this is one issue. Another is uh, structure of our defense industries in, in Visegrad countries. For instance, in Czech Republic, the defense industry, uh, it has you know, a couple of companies, mainly private ones, Whereas, for instance, in, in Poland, you have two major uh, state giant industries. I do not remember exactly what the structure in Hungary is because it's, it's already uh, 15 years that I, <laughs> I was there. But certainly uh, the structure... Uh, uh, but uh, I'm almost sure that, that the, the, the structure of the, of the industry will be different from, from Polish one and from the Czech one or Slovakian one. Plus, uh, not only different structures, but... Uh, there is also quite high level of protectionism in uh, uh, defense industry in all these four countries. It has different reasons. One of the reasons, and I, I can now say because I'm outside the government, I'm uh, two years temporary leave, happily. Uh, one reason is that uh, there are quite powerful uh, uh, defense lobbies in all four countries, and they uh, uh, can really exert some some pressure on, on the uh, political representation in uh in their interest. And also, um, the, the level of protectionism has another reason, and it is that really defense industry in all four countries is, and rightly so, regarded as a very you know, high developed and high tech industry that needs to be protected. And so those countries do not tend to expose too much their industries to really competition. So as I said, the, the level of protectionism, uh, I, I understand, but it posed a limit to really comparison between these uh, four countries. And last but not least, uh, we have differences in um, defense planning. Uh, you know, the majority of our defense planning of these all countries are guided by NATO uh, defense planning process. So I encourage you to go into uh, uh, NATO official sources to learn about more NATO defense uh, uh, planning process because it's quite complex issue, well structured, but it goes rather bilaterally between the secretariat or the, the institutions of NATO and respective member states. In the reality, we during the def NATO defense planning process, we. Uh, identify our, our needs or shortcomings and our capability gaps in our countries. We discuss it with, with NATO and then uh, all four countries are given individually uh, the, the respective tasks for development of uh, capability. For instance, now current topical task for the Czech Republic is to develop uh, armor brigades, heavy armor brigades until uh, 2026. Hungary has its own task. Poland has its own task. Again, uh, uh, so there is no much room for any regional uh, capability development, even though in some particular cases it's still worth considering. So speaking about those, lim there are these limits that, as I say, prohibited the, uh, during the whole existence a really major uh, tangible results. You can also go to web page of respective Visegrad presidency. Now we are at the end of the Czech presidency. We start with the Polish presidency. I prepared some uh, quotation of those uh, presidency plans, but I don't want to take too much uh, time from my presentation. But you will find very vague language in the Czech presidency plan, probably it will be the same with the Polish uh, 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 presidency, which means uh, um, that so far, as I said, the results are rather poor. Mm. 
we we may we may discuss the the, the language later on d- during the uh, during the summer school. But now, I do not want you know maybe I was a bit pessimistic pointing out two limits, but I think it's it's necessary to be aware of of, of those limits. But still, I did not want to say that we should forget about. Uh, security and defense cooperation, uh, even in, uh, inside uh, the Visegrad group. But taking into account this informal character of the V4 that I mentioned at the beginning, it has its pros and contrast. And I think uh, that the merit and pros may be that we can be very flexible in addressing some issues and to use uh, opportunities that appear rather on, on a short notice. But prerequisite is that prime ministers, our prime ministers, pay really attention to this a uh, very practical part of the Visegrad cooperation. I always said it has three dimensions, civic dimension mm-hmm. represented by the Visegrad Fund, then the cooperation of the line ministries, uh, and then external dimension. Unfortunately, the external dimension is the mo- is most sexy one. And, and you know that our prime minister, if they gather, they pay attention to different proclamations. And sorry to say, last five years, all the meetings, uh, of our prime ministers is rather a meeting of old crying babes. So I dare to say, if you uh, even read the last proclamation from the last meeting um, in Moravia and Czech Republic from prime minister, they're always complaining, they're crying how poor we are, how we should uh, uh, subsidize the, the richer countries in Europe, how affected we were by migration, how affected we were by uh, uh, coronavirus and uh, and so on and so forth. I understand, but I would like to hear from them some concrete proposal about our contribution to Europe, our, our contribution to Europe, to transatlantic community. And it connects uh, with, as I said, concrete opportunities that are, are there. So I will mention three of them. And I really, I, last week I published an article that I really regret that the prime ministers did not pay attention to this very concrete uh, uh, um, items. And, and generally that, that prime ministers do not pay really attention to the cooperation of the different line ministries because I think they are chiefs of the government. So they can have an agreement and they can bound the government to really conduct uh, they plans. Um, now, in my opinion, in security and defense field, I, I see, let's say, three uh, topical opportunities. One is the uh, our battle groups. You know that we had in 2016 and 2019 uh, so-called Visegrad battle groups inside EU, EU battle group. Uh, that was standby regime in 2016 and 2019 du- during the Czech presidency. Due to the fact that there is rather uh, difficulties in the system of deploying them uh, in European Union, they were never deployed. And probably uh, there is no good prospect that, that any EU battle group will be deployed any soon. But it costed us a lot of money you know, to certify our troops for this uh, Visegrad battle group. And now there is a prospect during the Polish presidency of the Visegrad group that we will airmark those certified units for EU uh, battle group to NATO rapid response forces, mainly to the VJTF, the most rapid forces of, of NATO, spearhead forces. So the prospect of using uh, our certified units for EU Visegrad battle group for NATO response forces that we can contribute as a group 
uh, to rapid reaction forces of the NATO will be first proof that we uh, 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 proof of rationality that we did not do not want uh, to waste the money invested in EU and we are ready to transform it to to other uh, uh, to to NATO and we we are ready to use our single set of forces for uh, merit of the both organizations. So why not prime minister discuss this and really uh, bounce and, and, and put the obligation of our, to our ministries to implement really uh, this, pro uh, this uh, uh, proposal first. Second, um, you know that uh, all four countries are involved in different foreign missions throughout the world, I would say. And uh, in the last couple of years, we shifted rather from our combat troops to, to training missions. So the Czech Republic, Poland, Hungary, Slovakia, we have trainers throughout the world. We have trainers in Afghanistan. We have trainers in, in, in Iraq. We have trainers in uh, Balkan. We have trainers uh, in Africa. Now there is a new opportunity opened uh, with establishment of... Uh, common uh, training center in Ukraine, joint, which is called Joint Multinational Training Group Ukraine, that was established in order to increase and enhan enhance tactical and operative capabilities of the Ukrainian army. And I think it is a, a good opportunity for us to send as a, our trainers there to this training in, in Ukraine because... First, we can uh, uh, transfer our experience from missions. Why not to Ukrainians? Uh, but second, we can also gain a lot uh, because today the Ukraine army is the only army in the world that has direct combat experience with Russia, right? And it is a very valuable partner for many countries, for United States, from Great Britain, for, for, for France even. Uh, so they have really very valuable experience. So I think it can, if we would really send a group, a lot of bunch of trainers there to this particular center in Ukraine, we can not only transfer our, our experience, but also gain a lot. I know that uh, uh, currently the, the uh, Ukrainian-Hungary relations in, in also in the security field is a difficult one, and I was not among those who uh, who criticized Hungary for that because I think that Hungary stands stand in in in, dis, uh, in dispute uh, about the minority rights in in, in uh, with uh, Ukraine is well grounded. But still, I I, I think again this is an opportunity for us to contribute. To contribute to safe uh, security in uh, in Europe, but also gain a lot. So why not prime ministers bothered to pay attention uh, to this opportunity? And again, I would expect them to make a really political decision that we go with this proposal, and uh, we expect our minister of defense to uh, propose concrete plans about deployment of trainers there. Um, third, very topical issue, uh, you know that tomorrow uh, there is a, a meeting of the European Council uh, and there will be debated a multi-annual financial framework and also this recovery plan that uh, two prim, uh, prime ministers of, of the group criticize heavily. I understand the critics. Uh, uh, yeah, critics before uh, negotiate, uh, you know, as a part of negotiation tactic is fine. But again, uh, what is very striking uh, is not only mm, uh, is uh, uh, that there was, let's say, general shift uh, in the priorities of the entire uh, multi-annual financial framework. So not only that we have this new uh, recovery plan, which is understandable, but uh, unfortunately, uh, the original plan uh, of European Commission that envisaged uh, 40 to 50 percent increase of money for security and defense has been changed substantially even before the pandemic crisis. And all the money devoted not only to research, 
and development, but entire security and defense field was lowered, lowered, and lowered. At the beginning, and more striking thing, and I think a uh, thing of strategic importance for Visegrad Group was money uh, that was supposed uh, to be given to military mobility. Military mobility is a key issue for us because if the troops cannot pass, right, in terms of crisis, uh, then it will be very negative for us. At the beginning, the, the commission proposed 6.5 billion euro to military mobility. Nowadays, latest plan even count on zero for military mobility. So at the, at the end of my presentation, I would encourage our prime ministers today, today have a video conference and to say that without any money, to military mobility, they will not approve uh, the multi-annual financial framework because, because it is a really matter of strategic importance. Um, I, I don't know whether they will do it or, or not, but uh, I wanted to point out that there are really opportunities uh, for us, but it requires uh, proper attention uh, by the political leadership. And uh, to sum up, I think uh, we should not uh, create any, let's say, closed block or blocking block in terms of security and defense policy. Uh, we are NATO members. We should be active uh, uh, NATO members. We should cooperate rather on ad hoc basis if opportunity arise. And if uh, there is any room for let's say regional grouping you know part of the uh, you know part of the uh, europe it is rather b9 so i think bucharest 9 is very promising format uh, it can be very powerful format because what is in our uh, common interest is to strengthen the resilience of the nato eastern flank because I think that NATO Eastern flank is really vulnerable. But, but uh, to debate more about the resilience of the NATO Eastern flank, which is now my current focus, and about the prospect of the Bucharest 9, it would be probably uh, a topic for any other uh, presentation, uh, maybe next year when the uh, situation allows me to participate in presence in Kersek, uh uh, which would be really fine for me because I'm always uh, enjoy being back to Hungary. Thank you for your attention.